Hey guys, welcome to the Biomechanics Lecture on Impulse Momentum Relationship. This is the introductory part one lecture that just tends to unpack where the impulse momentum relationship comes from and what the implications are with regards to biomechanics. Alright, so let's not waste any time and get straight into it. So you guys should all be familiar with Newton's second law, which in essence states that force is equal to mass times acceleration. So that's probably nothing new, right? In essence, what it means is, let's say, for example, I have some object of mass m, and I impart a force on that particular object. This object will tend to move in the direction of the force and will undergo some kind of change in velocity, right? the magnitude of this change in velocity is going to be dependent on the magnitude of the force but also how long that force is acting on that particular object right so the greater the force the greater this change in velocity also if this force tends to act on that object for a longer period of time there will be a greater change in velocity okay so this law is basically trying to unpack this, but we're going to delve a little bit deeper and try and get a, a better understanding of what the implications of that are. Something that you guys should also be familiar with is the fact that acceleration can be defined as the change in velocity over the change in time. So if I just replace this understanding of what acceleration is into this formula, I would sit with a slightly different version saying that F is equal to mass times this change in velocity over change in time. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take this change in time and multiply it over to the other side and I'm going to sit again with something that looks a little bit different. It's force times a change in time is going to be equal to this mass times the change in velocity. So in essence what I sit with now is completely new concepts. This force times change in time tends to come up quite a lot and is given a special letter, the letter J, which refers to the impulse generated and I'll unpack that in a separate video. And then on this uh, right hand side, this mass times change in velocity is given its own special letter, the small letter P, which is defined as momentum. And it's uh, this momentum that we're trying to unpack in this particular uh, video. Okay, so P or momentum is defined as mass times change and velocity. You can denote by the little arrow on top here that momentum is indeed a vector quantity, right? Yes, it is a vector and it therefore has magnitude and direction. Meaning that we would have to take both of those factors into consideration every single time that we try and determine the implications of the momentum of a particular system. Okay, what are the dimensions or what units is it measured in? So what are the dimensions of momentum? Well, you can see here it's dependent on the dimensions of mass and the dimensions of velocity, which is kilogram meters per second. It, it doesn't have a special name, it's not like it's converted to a Newton of some sort or some variation of that, it's just kilogram meters per second. That is the units in which momentum is typically measured. Okay, there's some important aspects that we have to take into consideration as well. The fact is that um, an object, as we could see here, can possess momentum. This object here has mass and it has some change in velocity, right? So, let's say, for example, I have a system of particles, right? 
they both have mass this is m1 and it's moving with some velocity this is m2 and it is moving with some velocity there's a collision situation that tends to happen when these two objects uh, come together so they tend to collide right and then they will move off with some velocity so this is still m1 and m2 provided that no mass is lost in this collision but now I will have uh, some final velocity of particle 1 and I will have some final velocity of particle 2 after this collision, uh, collision situation right so there's a new momentum that tends to be present within this particular system so that's what I want to unpack um, just a little bit more where I try and expand this formula a little bit. I'm just going to do it up here. So if I'm just expanding it up here, so it says that momentum is equal to mass times change in velocity. Something that we should remember as well is that this change in velocity is equal to the final velocity minus the initial velocity, right? So that's all from previous videos that we've unpacked. So in essence then I could write this momentum is equal to mass times and instead of this change in velocity I'm going to write it in this format that it is final velocity minus initial velocity and I sit with the following situation mvf minus mvi or in other words it's saying that momentum is equal to some final momentum minus some initial momentum is going to give me the change in momentum uh, that this particular system experienced right if I can rewrite this one more time it's saying that the final momentum of a system is equal to the change in momentum plus the initial momentum that was present it's exactly the same thing it's just often you'll see that in your textbooks in this particular format okay so this would be the particular momentum of one particular particle so this might be the momentum that particle one is possessing but I have to also factor in the momentum that particle two is possessing so the total momentum of a system of particles can be summarized as the momentum of all the individual particles within that system so if there's one particle this would be one and this would be the momentum of particle one if there's two um, then this would keep incrementing or keep increasing depending on how many particles in this particular system there are and I would sum them all up in order to get the total momentum there's an important aspect to that I'm not just mentioning that for for random purposes there's a particular claim that goes with this and it's one of the reasons why we tend to study momentum is the fact that momentum is conserved right in an isolated system so it means if there's no other external forces acting on a particular system of particles the momentum will be conserved and that's going to be irrespective of the type of collision that tends to occur talking about the types of collision there are three particular collision situations that are of importance okay um, I'm gonna unpack that uh, let me just clear some space here and um, I want to talk about the types of collisions that tend to occur I can have a perfectly elastic collision and basically what this particular type of collision refers to is one whereby all the kinetic energy is unchanged whatever kinetic energy a system of particles possessed before the collision is going to be exactly the same as a kinetic energy after the collision uh, remember kinetic energy is defined as one half mv squared so this would be 
the kinetic energy of particle one and the velocity that it possessed, right? So the kinetic energy um, of the system will then be the kinetic energy of all the individual parts. That is going to be conserved both before and after the collision situation. And I'll, I'll show you how that applies just now. There's also a uh, perfectly uh, inelastic collision. So this is a special type of collision whereby uh, particles or objects collide and they tend to stick together. Right? So say for example I have an object moving to the right, it collides with an object that is, is at rest and in essence the two objects will tend to stick together, maybe there's some glue in between or they tended to deform in the manner that they tend to stick together and both of those tend to move off with some combined velocity. So you can see here this would be m1 plus m2 and they both have a, a same velocity. And then everything in between those extremes is just an example of an inelastic collision. You'll find that the elasticity of that system is going to be somewhere between 0 to 1. In some instances it can be more than 1, but that's beyond the scope of what we're trying to uh, unpack at this, uh, at this particular point in time. So, let me show you a quick example um, whereby I'm just trying to open something here. Here we have a collision situation. I have a particle uh, with a mass of half a kilogram and I have a second particle with a mass of one and a half kilograms that we can see here, right? Um, what's going to happen is that this particular object over here is going to move to the right with a velocity of one meter per second and it's going to collide with this second object. In this instance, it's a perfectly elastic situation. Uh, I'm going to show the kinetic energy down here. So in a perfectly elastic um, collision, this energy should be conserved. So let's just see what happens here. Particles collide and they move off in opposite directions. Notice now that the speed has changed, right? It's a, there's a transfer of speed, but notice that the kinetic energy of the entire system is still conserved. Okay, what happens in an inelastic collision? We said that the particles should stick together and they will move off with a combined velocity. So let's see what happens in that particular case. All right. So notice that there's a shared velocity. Both move off with the same velocity, right? Notice that kinetic energy has been lost or transferred in other forms, okay? Um, but the particles stick together and move off with a same velocity. And if I have some elasticity in between, let's make it 50%. I'll restart it and let's see what happens. They will bounce off, but now their speeds are going to be drastically different, right? Notice kinetic energy is still not conserved. It is different to what it was beforehand. Um, and the particles move off with different types of velocity. Okay. So let me take you back to the screen. So how do we, how do we calculate uh, the momentum that these objects tend to possess? There's a rather simple formula for it. Um, note that momentum, like we said, was defined by this rather simple formula, mass times velocity. So I'm having a system of particles. In this situ situation, I have two particles. So if I have a perfectly elastic situation, it looks something like this, m1 v1 plus m2 v2. Right, this is the momentum before collision is equal to m1 v1 dash. Just to note that there's a there may be a new velocity here plus m2 v2 dash. Again, object two might have a new velocity, but this would be the momentum after the collision. Right, so this would be an example of what it would look like if there may be uh, an elastic type of a collision. What does it look like differently to an inelastic collision? 
Well, I still have momentum before you saw that the ball tends to move to the right and collide with the object at rest. Right? <coughs> and afterwards, the objects tend to collide and stick together with the same velocity. So that just simplifies to m1, m2, and we'll just call it v dash to signify that the both move with the same velocity. So if I know what the velocity is in the beginning, I can work out with what velocity the ob uh, objects will tend to move off at the end. <coughs> so if I use that scenario of the of the previous particles, uh, let's just try it. Uh, object one had a half a kilogram, right? Whereby I have this scenario, this first ball is half a kilogram moving with a velocity of one meter per second to the right. Uh, it collides with that second object which is at rest, it's 1.5 kilograms and it is at rest. So what happens afterwards is what we're trying to determine. Okay, so it is going at one meter per second. <coughs> it's colliding with that object at rest, so it was one and a half kilograms but it was moving with zero velocity, so that just simplifies to zero. And that's going to be equal to their combined masses. Right, M1 was 0 0.5 plus object 2 was 1.5. And I'm trying to solve for this combined velocity. So what I can do is I divide both sides by this combined mass. So I would sit with the following formula, 0 0.5 divided by 2 is equal to the combined velocity of both objects. And 0 0.5 divided by 2 is going to be 0 0.25 meters per second. And, and hopefully that's exactly what we saw. So remember, this is a perfectly inelastic uh, scenario. So they should collide and stick together. And what we're going to look for is what their combined velocities is after the collision. And sure enough, uh, it's 0 0.25, exactly what we predicted. Okay, uh, so hopefully that's given you a brief overview in terms of what uh, momentum is. In subsequent videos, we'll unpack a few more examples, some few more um, things for you guys to calculate, and then we'll start looking at the applications of impulse. Okay, thanks for listening.